Mortal Kombat 1 Story Mode is a four-star movie. Here's why. Just to note, this is solely a review of MK1's Story Mode campaign, not a review of the game as a whole. Safe to say that I am loving the gameplay, but wishing there was more of a variety between modes. I just love this case. Full spoiler warning starts now. NetherRealm Studios, also known as NRS, and the former Midway developers have always elevated storytelling when it comes to fighting games. You can take any of the NRS produced titles and use them as an example of some of the best storytelling in the genre. Now, some are better than others. Some have spawned expansive comic book epics or films like Injustice, and MK11's is probably the best to date in the genre. Maybe top of the Justice one. Mortal Kombat has insanely deep lore, and that's always been my main draw. The story. The hype? For MK1 as a sequel reboot was nearly unprecedented. They could go anywhere, although I was a little wary of another reboot. And they mostly stick the landing. Execution is consistently great across the board. Voice acting, choreography, graphical fidelity, and especially music are all next level. It feels like an immersive, playable, interactive, action movie. And to bring it all back to the beginning was genius. It's a good jumping on point for a lot of people, maybe not as good as some because it does reference MK11 pretty heavily, but we get origin stories for about every character with mostly good changes along the way. I especially enjoyed seeing Reptile, Baraka, Melina, and a few others become more than just generic baddies this go round. Actual sympathetic heroes is groundbreaking. Melina's changes make her feel like an actual character instead of just fan service. Baraka is a tragic figure and Reptile's story is a bit too similar to Baraka's, but his redesign and shapeshift to make him cooler than he has ever been. And that's just some of many. Now the plot unfolds a little slowly at first with the chapter system going the way it is. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of. But maybe conquest mode, please, someday. But the plot unfolds a little slowly, but steadily at first before getting absolutely bonkers at the end with the appropriate PlayStation trophies actually labeling the moment what just happened. It really, truly starts as something new, and then slowly turns into a consolidated 3D era remix. MK9 redid 1 through 3, MKX essentially remade MK4, and MK11 was a love letter bringing old and new together, and now MK1 remixes the entirety of what most consider the true 3D era on the PS2. Now I'm a huge 3D era fan. It's what got me into the series, especially Armageddon. So I was fine with this, even though I can feel a little bit rushed. You have the Deadly Alliance being the final boss, which is a complete letdown of both difficulty and the potential they had with someone like Onaga, Blaze, or many others at their disposal or other titans for something new teased in MK11. You have the deception being a throwaway a line from Liu Kang about Titan Shang Tsung being disguised as the Damashi, which is mentioned once and isn't quite as earned as the original game, but it's cool nonetheless. And then an alternate general shout mentions Armageddon for the realms and we even get the pyramid battle. All super duper cool ideas. Now some of this I admittedly ruined for myself by reading some leaks because the hype was just so high for this and other things I had no idea. But MK1 does a lot with story arcs for classic characters, building a ton of relationships that can pay off later before it goes from zero to 100 very fast. And I was fully on board with it for the most part. So I guess not fully on board, anyway. Loved all the references and the Titan Chain Sun twist is good and very cool for the lore, even though most saw it coming. Making sense and canonizing other projects like Snowblind, which is even referenced, which made me happy because I heard my review of that initially. I love the ideas that opens up that both endings in MK11 were canon leading to the MK multiverse. It's not overly explained, it's perfectly satisfactory, but what I was not expecting was them to tap into that multiverse for the final battle, which is a genius idea. Showcasing all the different random character assortments you can fight on the pyramid, which has no real story reason to exist, the pyramid, which is kind of disappointing as it had a huge story reason in MK Armageddon, but that also makes me wonder if we'll get character creation at some point in the DLC considering some of these not only had costume variations, but original Reiko moves as an example with Raiden special moves together. I really hope they bring that back. I love that mode in games. They even mind the obvious but cool fan service for a wonderful character moment for Liu Kang, who is characterized so well as the new protector and keeper of time with Titan Kitana. Liu Kang deserves that happy moment, and I hope he gets a happy ending, considering the arcade ending kind of hints at tragedy again, because he's been defined by tragedy for so long. They probably could have brought in more characters to serve in these cutscenes, but what we have worked for me. Everything is appropriately insane, and you get to choose your fighter in that last chapter. But it's a little confusing. It's that character you choose a Titan variation character. Liu Kang teleports whoever you play as a way and Shang Tsung just kind of turned to dust. So were we just some other variation? The last chapter also abandons all the characters from before with no real resolution to any of them. Asha straight up disappears and why does the timeline break down but then Titan Havoc is there in the credit scene able to be there? Did he take over that timeline? I have so many questions and those last two chapters are just a little too rushed to satisfy many answers. The battle is great fun but the final fight feels so anticlimactic and easy to such buildup that I can't help 
but feel a little disappointed. However, the final cutscene is a perfect jumping off point for what I assume to be several expansions coming, at least I hope, and it provides, albeit quick, some closure. But something that already feels like a true expansion of the story is the arcade endings. Player watch all of the arcade endings here. Now, MK Lemons have all been canonized by the story in this game, which Snowblind hinted at, but now MK1's character endings are all canon. In the arcade ladder mode, in fact, they are 100% necessary to get closure on most of the characters or where they're headed from the main campaign. I greatly appreciate this as a way to tie up loose ends that they just didn't have time and budget for in the cinematics. I'd prefer it in the campaign, and on a certain level, it is a story cop out. But it's also a bit ingenious to take a former what if mode for each character and their ending what would have happened and make them into compelling arc closures for every single character that expand the lore and hint at the future for the series. I greatly recommend you check all of these out. If you don't feel like going through all of them and beating them, watch them on YouTube. We also get big story arcs started for better or worse, even though some end, some just kind of get going. The tournament itself is a bit of an afterthought, which is kind of a letdown, but I suppose that it could make a larger return down the line. Beyond Sub-Zero and the Linkway's downfall is in full effect, which is unsurprising. In fact, a lot of the story arcs cover most of the same ground, just in a modern retelling with a couple twists. Some are executed better than others that feel rushed or just don't have enough time. For example, I was extremely let down by Havoc's role in the story. Leaks and all ruined a lot of MK1's info, but it felt as if there was going to be a huge development with him. That could still be coming with later invasions or expansions due to the credit scene, but the idea that he and Dairu, one of the most forgettable 3D era characters, are one and the same is genius and even ties back to the old game's lore with hints in those games that Havoc is formerly from Sado or Order Realm, whatever you want to call it, and with Chaos Magic could he even be a future version of Dairu in every timeline. But there's no mention of this in MK1. In fact, to even know that he's Dairu, to know who he is before he gets his face burned, you have to get in-character intros before versus battle in specific modes because they're not in every mode. Havoc gets disfigured, but unless you're a hardcore fan, there's no mention of how he contorts and twists his body the way he does, or what the heck his obsession with Chaos is about, or how he uses that, or how he got the name Havoc if he's supposed to be Dairu. It's a missed opportunity I hope gets corrected. Several characters don't get what I'd hoped, as it largely focuses on the classics, so don't expect a ton for Rain, Reiko, or Nitara. Their arcade endings are incredibly insane, and as mentioned, canning, so it's worth doing those to get more out of it. And that does in turn make the story feel a little bit more complete. Definitely have mixed feelings about Kwai Liang being Sub-Zero. Kwai Liang Sub-Zero is my favorite character in Mortal Kombat, with Hanzo Asashi Scorpion being right behind him. But they combine those two into one. And I'll say it works for the story, for the fallout, for the arcs, and for the forming of the Shirai Ryu. But I'm not convinced the identity needed to change beyond the Brotherhood. It could have been Hanzo and not been much different, or Kwai Liang could have come in later. It sort of feels like taking Batman and Superman, but now Clark Kent is Batman. Which maybe that's an extreme example, but still, it's an odd choice that makes sense in execution, but it's questionable as to why. Why did they have to do that? Especially since Hanzo is still here, he shows up in the character endings as a child. At least the real Scorpion shows up in Invasions, which I'll offer more story content in that way. Here's hoping Kwai Liang defeats Bihan, reclaims Lin, Lin Kuei in the Mantle from Zero, and leaves the Shirai Ryu to Hanzo in the Mantle of Scorpion. That makes a lot of sense, and as a character arc progression could be cool and could be a cool way to kind of inverse the rivalry. I'm also disappointed that there was no smoke chapter. He's my new main and he's my boy and I wanted more from him. Mortal Kombat 1's story feels like Avengers Secret Wars and Endgame and Infinity War all at the same time. Maybe a little bit of No Way Home too. It brings together so many elements to feel like a bonkers blockbuster temple that I gladly see in theaters, recommend to my friends, and praise often, even if the multiverse is everywhere right now and a, a little too much, it's the thing. But this game had a little too much secrecy and hype behind the story and it foils its own ambitions sometimes, but not being as original as it should be or could be. We're not committing to older lore as much as it should or could either, finding a weird, somewhat anticlimactic balance at a couple pivotal moments. That's not to diminish incredible cutscenes, voice work, and so many amazing twists and turns that kept me on the edge of my seat, setting up an insane new universe with infinite possibilities. I am content and happy, even if I worry about NRS's ability to be original with the story sometimes. Rock solid, Best in class story modes are a main thing for this dev though. As you can see, I have positives with some negatives and some kind of in between things because I always try to look for the good. And if you like that take, if you like me doing that, please hit subscribe, like the video, it really helps me out and ring that bell for more notifications. If they're not gonna do something completely new, like they kind of did with MK11, follow up on Reiko's ending. That was absolutely crazy. And I'm very excited about seeing Onaga possibly in the future.
So glad MK is back. Not that it never really went anywhere. We have more MK content than ever. And all of that is to say that Mortal Kombat 1 story mode campaign is a four out of five star story if it were a movie. Thank you so much for watching. Play Mortal Kombat 1. Of course, it's Red Jam, very bloody. Parents, this is not for kids. Great story. As Jeremy John say, lore over gore. And I feel like they still do that very well. Remember, always look for the good.